dance in Cloudland, two activities that she found to be most annoying, she focused on the small island within her mind where she could still control herself and where she often visited when director Jack Cavins was being a particularly obnoxious toad. One of his more basic traits, which had likely been established long before he was born, and curiously imagined herself to be enjoying the most excellent Cuban cigar while noting, as Professor Sigmund Freud had once observed in one flavor or another, firstly, that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and secondly, that, insofar as Darla was concerned, this was one of those sometimes. Evans, who like Darla, was a braino, and who as a puzzling consequence of a minor indiscretion Darla had committed in the presence of the imperial director had been given nearly complete control of Darla for two years, apparently as a reward for him, but actually as a punishment for her. Evans certainly had a penchant for being totish. For physicals, those humans who had not yet abandoned their bodies in favor of living as brains within mirrored, classic orbs, two years was a long time. But for a braino who was connected to an elaborate and quite complex set of illegal Arvelian perceptual interface modifying, enhancing and controlling devices, which were being operated by another braino who had the security override code for this classic orb of the braino being controlled, two years easily became a virtual eternity. The Arvelian equipment, among other things, could transform a few milliseconds of real time into hours and hours of virtual time. And were it not for Darla's little island of escape and safety, she would likely have gone insane, or at least would have become a bit batty. Of course, she had moments, but generally, she made an effort to endure Kevin's tinkering with her mind while simultaneously making every effort to devise some way effectively to tinker with Kevin's mind. Darla had not become a powerful company director by being a fool. And even though it might take a while, she was certain there was some way to exert a bit of her influence on Kevin's. begun noticing a pattern in Kevin's strange fascination, and the pattern of events usually began by Kevin's making her float among clouds and fog while she was forced to lick postage stamps. After doing this for a while, Kevin's then would begin playing musical recordings from the 1930s and 1940s of the planet Earth, and since this music nearly always made Darla want to do what she called her sexy dance, Darla would soon Rogers in an enchanting private ballroom that suddenly appeared in an open area among the clouds and fogs of this place she called Cloudland. At the edge of the ballroom, the dance floor blended smoothly into the fog, but although there were carefully placed bright lights all around the ballroom and a spotlight which 
first classic orbs. Life support system would provide the necessary chemicals and energy her brain needed. And for practical purposes, she could do whatever she desired to do so long as, in her current circumstances, she wanted to do it and Kevin's allowed her to do it. Although her sense of time was a bit confused by the Arbellian perceptual interface equipment, she nevertheless had a reasonably good sense of how time passed in the surreal ballroom. And even though she was not entirely certain this was the case, it appeared to her that once she had increased the intensity of her sexy dancing, Cavins had not interrupted her dancing by being a toad and making her float endlessly through clouds and fog while licking postage stamps. In fact, the more she pondered this, albeit very privately when she escaped to her little island, the more she began to suspect that Cavins actually enjoyed watching her dance like Ginger Rogers. Being especially bright and understanding fully on many levels that enjoyment and pleasure are powerful motivators, Darla began to devise a strategy which she hoped would increase her power in this strange game Cavins was playing with her, apparently toward some goal which she simply could not understand or imagine at the moment, no matter how much she tried to comprehend it. Her strategy was very simple, really, and the first step was to engage Cavins in some type of conversation. Virtually anything would be significant, because so far Cavins had never said even one word to her formally. Instead, at least as it appeared to her, Cavins devoted most of his attention to operating the various Arbellion perceptual interfacing devices and perhaps occasionally devoted a bit of attention to observing her in some way that she sensed but could not exactly describe. If she had been a cupcake or a glass of wine, she might have thought that Cavins was tasting her. But insofar as Darla knew, there was no way to taste the thoughts of a brain Had Darla known a little bit more about science, physiology, and the capabilities of some of the more advanced Arvillian perceptual interfacing equipment, she would not have been so surprised to discover not only that it was possible to taste the thoughts of brainos, but also that it was possible to taste the thoughts of physicals. Although this latter activity required installing a miniature interface into a certain part of the brain of the physical being tasted, something which was easily done but very difficult to detect, even by the most advanced non arvelian methods. In fact, although it was unbeknown to Darla, Kevin's primary activity and purpose in everything he did with Darla was to taste her thoughts more fully than any other brain or physical before. And since Kevin's had been perfecting the art of tasting thoughts for centuries, in a strange way, it was a bit of an honor that he had selected Darla specifically to become his thought-tasting masterpiece. Kevin's truly was a grand master of the art of tasting thoughts, and he constantly strove to move the art of tasting thoughts to new and ever more fascinating levels. Of course, Darla knew nearly nothing about this aspect of Kevin's, and even if she had known about it, she did not have the formal scientific training required to understand it mathematically. But she had one thing that junior director Jack Cavins did not have and likely never would have. Specifically, she had the fascinatingly curious and oftentimes remarkably accurate talent which most common folk and experts alike call female intuition. She might not know so much about mathematics and physics, but she could tell when someone was pulling her chain. And in this particular instant, it certainly appeared intuitively obvious to her that Cavins was making a diligent, concerted effort to pull her chain over and over and over. And from her perspective, which no doubt was enhanced considerably by female intuition, if Cavins was pulling her chain, then she might be able to pull his chain. And as she was pondering this insight, which was beginning to be more like an epiphany, she 
remembered an old adage about a goose and a gander, which she found to be quite amusing and more than a little bit instructive in an oddly curious way. As minutes changed to hours and hours changed to days, Darla continued thinking about her new strategy until, on one enchanted summer's evening, in the surreal ballroom that Cavins had so eloquently constructed for her, Darla put her plan into motion. She, or more correctly Cavins, had selected a beautiful, paper-thin, translucent black silk dress and a cute pair of matching high-heel dancing slippers with ankle straps and open toes. And since this was her favorite attire for ballroom dancing, she realized that Cavins had either learned how to read her mind or certainly had excellent taste in fashion and had somehow influenced her visual and tactile senses for a very specific reason. Although she did not know precisely what Cavins' motivations were, she recognized that it did not matter so much, really, and for whatever reason, her realization that this appeared to be a special and significant moment, in fact, allowed her to make it all the more special and significant in terms of her plan. From Dulles, newly found perspective, if Cavins desired to dress her elegantly with a hint of sensual eroticism and to play with her like a doll, then perhaps she will become a bit more of a doll than Cavins had ever imagined she could be. And simply stated, this is what she did. As she danced around the surreal ballroom, instead of focusing entirely on enjoying the moment and herself, Dolly began looking around the ballroom a bit more intensely, but nevertheless surreptitiously. In effect, although it is difficult to describe in a tangible way, what she was doing was attempting to look beyond the boundaries of the surreal ballroom towards the goal, perhaps, of seeing or sensing more of what Cavins was doing or observing. And after doing this for a while, she did something which quite startled Cavins. She spoke directly to him in a voice that he had neither expected nor imagined to hear, especially considering the dulling effects of the elaborate and complex Arvelian perceptual interfacing equipment he was using to control Darla. But the way she said it suggested to Cavins that Darla was beginning to understand the elaborate game he was playing with her. This so surprised Cavins that he momentarily let his attention, which was focused intensely on controlling the Arvelian perceptual interfacing equipment, wander, which in turn caused the Arvelian artificial intelligence algorithms, which were designed always to expect and for practical purposes to demand to be given intense focus immediately to search for a controlling brain. In this brief instance, the only nearby brain which was intensely focused on controlling anything was Darla's brain. And in a very beautiful way, the Arvelian perceptual interfacing equipment not only understood on the most intimately deep level precisely what Darla wanted, needed, and desired to hear, but also captured the mind of junior director Jack Cavins, created a suitably attired simulacrum for him, made this simulation of him appear in a surreal ballroom, stood him directly in front of Darla, made his eyes look into hers, and then directed him to say this word. Yes! In another galaxy, thousands of light years away, Fragrance and replied, 
Soon, my love. Soon, my love. Back in the surreal ballroom, floating among the clouds, rolling fog and twinkling stars, junior director Jack Cabins, who is a physical, had been afflicted with a curious medical condition called jumping French Canadian of Maine, began flapping his arms wildly and screaming hysterically. Yes, 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 yes. Outwardly, director Darla Trivet did not move or even twitch a muscle, but inwardly, she smiled and had an amusing thought about the goose and the gander. <laughs> <laughs> 